This episode of Lawyers Tell All is brought to you by the Intake Academy. Do you know how to cement relationships with more of your ideal clients, get them to commit to you, and send you more referrals than you ever thought possible? Visit www.intakeacademy.com where you will get the strategies you need to make the most of your marketing and advertising dollars. Plus, develop a team of intake specialists and attorneys who convert more qualified case opportunities and build meaningful relationships with prospective clients. Welcome to the Lawyers Tell All podcast, where Chris Mullins, the preeminent sales and communications consultant in the legal industry, shows you how it looks through lawyers' eyes. Here, innovators in the trenches provide powerful insights that help you connect with new clients, handle the sometimes harsh realities of the legal profession, and embrace the mindsets needed to succeed. Be sure to visit our website at www.lawyerstellall.com. And while you're there, subscribe to us via your favorite network. Now, lean in. Tune in and let's take a deep dive. Hello, everyone. It's Chris Mullins with the Intake Academy and the Expert Interview Series. And today I'm interviewing a good friend of mine, Charlie Mann. Go ahead and introduce yourself, Charlie. Hey, Chris. It's awesome to see you. I'm really excited to talk with you and kind of whatever Mm -hmm. comes out. I mean, you and I both have like this weird combination of industry insider experience working in law firms and we've had a good relationship now for like a decade both of us coaching uh law firms and uh you know i'm excited to maybe get into the weeds a little bit explore some places that not everyone looks at when it comes to like what's going on in a person's law firm or you know what are some of the the weird ways that we came to be coaching law firms the way that we do um which you know, I've now been doing for almost 13 years at this point uh, after starting out with Ben Glass uh, and great legal marketing and answering this weird little Craigslist ad a long time ago. Yeah, that's awesome. So what are some of the weird things? <laughs> <laughs> you know, they? it's so cool. I, I was just actually, uh, I was over hanging out at Blue Shark Digital recently with Seth Price. Uh, I did a presentation for his crew and Seth and I were sort of talking about um, the unusual way that lawyers, when they come out of law school, like you and I know this, they are these perfectly packaged products, right? That's that's kind of what they've gone to law school is to become a product where you can sell your expertise, you can sell your knowledge, you can uh, sell what you do. Mm-hmm. Um, and what isn't obviously talked about there are the weird quirks of like, how attached that com- uh, how much that attaches to your personal identity and mm-hmm. how lawyers can get really roped into the legal work that I produce, like that I produce yeah. is who I am rather than maybe transcending to becoming a business owner, which is the space that you and I play around in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I think that is probably the most interesting and fascinating challenge mm-hmm. in the work that we do is addressing that, that identity concept and using it not just viewing it as like, oh, this is a potential disadvantage, but like, oh, this is a huge opportunity for a human being to explore who they are past what they went to school to. Because actually, I, I don't know this, Chris. What did you go to school to do? <laughs> I actually uh, went to high school. That's it. And when it. There you go. I love it. it I, you know, I wish if I could go back. I've had a lot of marketing directors ask me this question because I was a theater major, right? And they ask if I could go back, would I have like... Uh, gone through a different major. And my response is always, I wouldn't have gone to college. Mm -hmm. I would have, like, I probably would have learned how to become a copywriter instead. I would have focused on like a marketing trade Mm -hmm. rather than learning, you know, just generally like marketing. (laughs) Yeah. Right. 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 So uh, like when, when the attorneys at school, it it is amazing to me still, you know, now that they still are not taught anything about you know, if you want to um, have your own practice, or if you even when you go at, to another practice, um, or, you know, the human side of the relationships, that, you know, nothing like sales or empathy or communicate. <laughs> none of that. So it's just, just the basic everyday kind of thing. They're just, they're not, they're not taught that. And to me, that's just interesting still. 
I was talking with someone, uh, in this case, not Seth, but someone else the other day about like the issue of the law is a jealous mistress. Um, Cause they actually hadn't really heard that term before, even though they're within the legal profession. Like, you know, I haven't heard this uh, and, and you know, what exactly does it mean? And what was really interesting is not only, you know, you and I know what it means, right? The law is going to try and dominate your time. It's going to take from your family. Like that, that's yeah. the creepy implication yeah. of that saying, mm-hmm. right? Like the law is a jealous mistress. Well, mm-hmm. you shouldn't have that one way or the other, mm-hmm. but the idea that uh, going to a convocation, we had someone um, in the law firm who graduated from law school and uh, we were at her convocation. And I remember hearing the speaker talking about, right? Like the client, you, you are here simply to serve the client. The law is a jealous mistress, all this stuff. And it was, I had heard like Ben Glass talk about it, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but I hadn't seen it up close until that point in time. Yeah. And it really caught me off guard. It was a little, a little sad. But then again, I think about like my background in theater was all about, oh, you know, you're, the phrase that they would use is like, you're a slave to the art. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And even in like the audition class, which would have been the most commercial class I ever took, mm-hmm. it was so little of it was how do you actually get in front of auditions? And so much of it was like workshopping monologues, but trying to do it with 25 students. So no one was really getting any attention. Or... Yeah, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It happens in all professions. It, ha- it happens in all professions. But the other thing too, is I noticed just working with law firms for 30 years now that uh, and a lot of my students, they're not just intake anymore. They're attorneys. And mm. what I see with all the different attorneys is entitlement is like unbelievable. Like, even though they work at a practice, they have a job and somebody's paying them. Yeah. They don't, they don't want, they don't want to conform. They, they, it's totally hundred percent entitlement. They don't play well with others and they just, you know, they're, they're here to, you know, take care of the client, but not even take care of them really, really well. I mean, I'm sure there's some out there that do, but a lot of them are like, look, I'm putting in all the time. I'm putting in all the hours. You know, I'll dot, I'll dot my I's and cross my T's. And, that, and that's really it. The human side isn't there. And the, the idea of entitlement is huge. Do you think that's gotten worse? Because like I've, I, so I've been doing this for 13 years. You've been doing it for 30 years. So you've seen it over a longer span of time. I've seen it sort of in the internet rich space with all of this. Mm-hmm. So ha- has that gotten worse over the last couple of decades? I think it's gotten worse for the main reason is that law firms are getting better and better at marketing and the mindset of spending money on marketing. And, you know, that's a whole nother topic because I don't know that they do it all (laughs) for the right reason, (laughs) you know, more more of, um, you know, ego or something like that. But, uh, but because firms are doing that, they're more focused on like the bottom line because they're running a business and the cases are coming in, but they're not really good at getting team and staff to take care of them. So everybody's got stacks of cases. So the attorneys are more like, yeah, you know, it's totally entitlement. And I think it's gotten worse because they're inundated with cases, more very unreasonable amount of cases. I see a lot of lawyers who uh, don't like the idea of following someone else's process because it takes away the art side of the law, right? This is something that we deal with oftentimes with a firm that is like when I talk about talk to law firms, sort of the journey to a million dollars, it's like a marketing journey, right? And mm-hmm. then the journey from a million to say three million, it's really a systems and processes journey, right? Like mm-hmm. being able to repeat what you do. Mm-hmm. And what I often hear about are like I can't get my attorneys to stop being rogue agents basically. Like I can't get them to follow simple best practices that for the owner worked really well when they were the first attorney. And maybe they had that like one associate, right. Who Mm -hmm. was totally bought in because I hired that associate and the associate was fresh out of law school and didn't know any better. And then they're looking for, Hey, how do I hire a five to seven year experience attorney, bring them in? Will they run my system? And that seems like this big tripping up point where they come in and what, what's the uh, the Dunning Kruger effect? A lot of lawyers, I think, have the Dunning Kruger effect, which is that like scale of 
when you know a little, you think that you know a lot when in yeah. fact you, you know nothing, right? Yeah. Um, and so a lot of lawyers will have for the legal work that Dunning-Kruger effect and not want to come in and like be an apprentice. Oh, Chris, this is cool. I was watching a, a video about a sushi chef the other day talking about like the amount of time that it takes to become a sushi, sushi chef. I can barely mm -hmm. say the words. <laughs> <laughs> and like, look, it, it, the way they said it is it takes three to seven years to know how to prep the stuff properly. It takes 20 years to really become a sushi mm -hmm. chef. Mm -hmm. And that's how I feel about some of this stuff is like, once you've learned the technical side, whatever field that you're in, mm -hmm. you now need to sink in and go, cool, I can do the work, but now I need to know the field. And that's a very different. Yeah. And I, I see that too. I think from my side, it's more, you know, the owner might've done it and yeah. done really well and created the processes and systems and all of that. But when you go from the owner, um, you know, doing all of that, and then you kind of grow, grow, grow and grow. I don't really think that we do a really good job at letting all the hiring the right people, the right attorneys, letting that yeah. are going to do that process and system. But we also don't really hold them accountable. And we also have a lot of other leaders and managers that aren't really holding anybody accountable. So I think it's hard for the owner's message to kind of get there and stick there if all the yeah. others are not doing it. I mean, owning, owning a practice, especially, you know, I know that you, you work with like some really cool growing bigger firms. Um, and I can imagine being the owner of that type of firm and struggling with the idea of you, you have these two forces that might get pulled. The force that you're talking about where it's all about, Hey, you've got the business and right. Yeah. You, you do need to have some business principles, but at what point are we so much just like, this is a business, 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 business. Mm -hmm. that we're starting to treat it like a max min oil company, right? We're trying to max everything with minimal spend just mm -hmm. to squeeze profit margin. And on the other side, you have like the culture discussion that we hear from folks like Bill Biggs out there um, focusing on, hey, it, it's all about culture. It's all about people, da, 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 da. And that, those two things don't always get reconciled. Like how do you have uh, maybe like a performance culture where people – feel not just managed, but led. I think I see mm -hmm. that a lot in law firms these days. There's a lot of managing, not as much leading. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, hey, I heard this thing that we should all be doing at a conference. Yeah, right. Um, but they're not really like leading how that should be done. They just see someone else's best practice and want it for their firm instead of saying, what is culturally endemic to my practice that I can build on top of? And that's hard because like, let's say you're looking at Mike Morse's firm, right? A uh, mm -hmm. huge firm up in Detroit. He wrote the book Fireproof. And you go, I want to have that firm. Okay. But remember, you're not Mike Morse. Mm -hmm. Now, if you are like him, you should follow a lot of what he's doing. But if you're not like him, don't try and squeeze your path. Mm -hmm. You know, don't try and make yourself into someone that you're not. That's, you don't want to wake up, you know, two decades later and go, I don't like my firm. I don't like myself. And I never see my family. Mm -hmm. yeah. that's depressing mm -hmm. it is but the, the other thing too is I don't I don't always get the impression that we want to work like <laughs> yeah. really roll up your sleeves and work and grow versus just kind of jumping in and getting a paycheck yeah uh and that is probably true at like every single level of a practice um and I think there's even owner fatigue. And mm -hmm. the way that I can really identify owner fatigue is like, if I'm coaching a law firm and all of the discussion becomes just around ideas, ideas are really important. Yeah, Big ideas are very important. Yeah. But if all we're ever doing is just talking about the ideas, instead of getting focused and saying, how's it getting done? Okay. You didn't get that part done. What held you up? Mm -hmm. How do we make sure that that gets implemented next time? And what is the accountability measure in place? Right. You know, it might be a coach like you or me who's mm -hmm. enforcing that, like, okay, you're getting that done because we don't get to move on to the fun stuff until you yeah. get that stuff done. Right, right. We had a mastermind member, uh, Mark Breyer, who was with us for over a decade, amazing attorney, awesome guy out in Phoenix. Yeah. 
And I remember a phone conversation I had with him. He was like, Charlie, I've been around this space for in the GL mastermind for a decade. Like it's, it's kind of really simple. The difference between the people who are like blowing up really big and those who are not, is just the implementation. Right. Right. And deciding, making a decision. I think, I think we're, you know, what I see is still the shiny object is in the way. And, and we all are looking for the silver bullet. Like, yeah. We're not really listening to the consultant or the trainer or the teacher. We're just more like, well, come on, come on. What what is the silver bullet here? What is it? That's what I want. And yep. you know, we want to cut corners, and you can't really cut corners. I wonder if you, if you had this same experience, Chris. Which is like the best for me. A lot of times, the best client, best coachee, is someone who has actually been coached before and had to learn what a coaching process is like. And usually with the first coach, even if that coach did a really good job, mm-hmm. it didn't quite click mm-hmm. because that person wasn't ready to be coached. And like the first coach was like, was like putting a coat of primer on the walls mm-hmm. before you can actually paint. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they recognize like, oh, part of coaching is not just listening to Chris's or Charlie's ideas. Mm-hmm. Part of coaching is like, I need to reflect back or listen to their questions and launch my ideas. I was actually just reading a book about, about coaching. I mean, you know, right. Mm-hmm. Always should be a student of your own game. Mm-hmm. And even though it's such rudimentary advice, I di- I still highlighted the passage where it talked about uh, the answer, the, the answer your uh, coachee gives, even if it's imperfect, is better than the perfect answer that they don't believe in, right? It was something like that. Mm-hmm, yeah. Because mm-hmm. they have to own the idea and then execute on it. If they don't feel that ownership of the idea, they're going to poke a million holes. I mean, right? They're a lawyer. This is the, 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 the interesting. They will litigate their way out of an idea. And it's not unique to lawyers. Like if we were to go and do this with like plumbers, it would probably be the same thing. Mm-hmm. Just happens to be lawyers are even more gifted at the rhetoric required to disable the yeah, idea. They, they are. They can they can definitely talk themselves out of it. What about what are some of the um biggest challenges that you find with law firms that it's time to kind of rebrand and get to the next level? Usually it's so if we're talking about it, it's it's letting go. That's what it is. It's letting go. It is the owner having the ability to let go and say, I'm moving up to the next space. And the journey being acknowledged for the owner, like, okay, you were the really good business development person. A lot of law firms get built because the owner, like they're really good at business development. Mm -hmm. Right. But then Mm -hmm. they get to the point where they have to develop systems and they go, ah, that freaks me out. Yeah. And so they don't do it Mm -hmm. and they don't challenge themselves to learn that next new skill. It's actually why I'm a big proponent for anyone who I coach I expect them to have some type of hobby that interests them where they're learning new stuff regularly Mm -hmm. because they have to keep that thought pattern alive. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And then they have to learn how to be, they don't have to sit down and write, you know, standard operating procedures. They don't have to be the SOP person, Mm -hmm. but they do need to lead the effort and hold the team accountable for that. And then after processes are in place, they need to focus on people and culture, which levels up and actually... I had a, I had a private client who he had to fire a marketing director. It was like the first time he ever had a major firing, smaller mm-hmm. firm, uh, mm-hmm. you know, upper mid six figures. Mm-hmm. And he felt really bad because he'd been trying to get this person to succeed over and over again. Mm-hmm. I said, you know, look, let's hear what name will I give him? Let's give him the name Bill. Mm-hmm. Um, so Bill, here's the issue. You, you only are going to lead so many people in your life. This isn't like writing a marketing headline where you can write a hundred and figure out which fails. And you can write a hundred in a month and find out the failures. Mm-hmm. You have to acknowledge that maybe you've failed this person as a leader and mm-hmm. they are not prepared to become the new person they can be at your firm. They need a fresh space for them to achieve their highest potential. Mm-hmm. And you need a fresh person in yeah. that space. That way you can achieve your mm-hmm. highest potential as a leader. Mm-hmm. That's hard. It, it, it's hard, but like, and, and that's important, the fresh space, because it, sometimes it just comes down to that. It's like, you know what? It's time. Yeah. And, and, and just, just a clean slate makes you feel like you can begin again. Whereas if you keep the same person and keep trying to 
get them to change, that's yeah. not going to happen. And it's toxic. It's, it's, well, they, they're holding on to a version of you mm -hmm. that may not exist anymore that you don't want to have existing anymore. You're like, I'm, I'm the snake that has shed its skin. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Ready to be my next. I'm done. Self. I'm going up to the next. Exactly. So like, Oh, you know, a marketing director who I used to have a really collaborative relationship with. And now I'm telling you, I need you to be totally autonomous for me because I'm busy with this other side of the thing. Mm -hmm. And they, that, that marketing director now feels rejection. And yeah. um, unless they have, have enough, uh, enough coaching or self help or, or, you know, whatever in their life, whether they've initiated it or it's the culture that you've created, mm -hmm. they're probably not prepared to take that leap and acknowledge like, oh, this for me, marketing director is actually a brand new, exciting journey to explore myself as an autonomous mm -hmm. human being and an autonomous marketer, which scares me, but excites me. They're just most of the time going to default to old patterns. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's important to have, like for me, in my business, a law firm will hire Intake Academy and we're basically coaching almost the entire firm. So what I'm trying to say is it's important to invest in the trainers or the coaches or the consultants for your team. Like I'm doing, I, yeah. I meet with the, the owners, but it's mostly for the team. And so if you can't do it, which you shouldn't be doing it, then, yeah. then just hire, hire an outside service like, you know, yourself or myself or, or, or another one and let your team get the attention that they need, the coaching that they need so that they can kind of, you can shape their minds. Yeah. I mean, it, you hire people to do your web development. Yeah. A lot of times you're going to hire, you're going to hire an IT team. Eventually mm -hmm. you might hire outsourced HR. That's the whole thing with like coaching. It's just, it's not, it's not as discussed as other places, mm -hmm. but outsourcing coaching it's a really demanding thing to do like you, obviously you know that chris it's like a weirdly demanding thing to do mm -hmm. now just like in some law firms you're going to have a leader who's maybe a great marketer or uh, someone who's going to be a great systems architect in mm -hmm. some law firms the owner is a great coach right mm -hmm. i have people who i coach who are great coaches but let me just say like what i just said was I have people who I coach who are great coaches. I'm mm -hmm. sure you encounter this as well. Like you're the force behind the force that is driving because they need you, right? Like they, they, they quietly need the ability to like get on the phone with Chris and go, Ooh, it's been a tough week. Mm -hmm. Cause it's lonely at the top, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah it is. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is all tops. <laughs> yes. Yes. And, and the other thing too, is that um, it's important to like make a decision when you build your business, when you build your firm, what tools are you going to put in place to help your team? Like right away, like what, yeah. are, what are they going to be? What are you, what are you going to do? And I don't really think that's thought of that much. And do you ever recommend any of those to firms? The different tools? Yeah, like tools or books or stuff that they should have. Yeah, book books a lot. And um, if I know of resources of, of different coaching or masterminds, I'll mention it to them. I'll encourage yeah. them. If there are, if there are, uh, even if there is like intake training um, and communications and relationship training by somebody else at a conference, I say, go, you got to go. Yeah. And yeah. So I absolutely do. But one of the biggest things I always recommend is masterminds. Yeah. You know, because they're, they're huge. A mastermind is really important. 20, 25 people, you'll learn a lot, but you'll get your, your situation solved, whatever it is, and you'll be held accountable. And I think that the, the relationship between like having a coach and being part of a mastermind can be so some people think it's like at, putting a hat on a hat right like oh if i have a coach and i'm in a mastermind i have the same thing i was i was just talking with someone interested in a mastermind program the other day about this and he's like oh you know if i join the mastermind should i stick with my coach he's with a program that a lot of people would know the name mm -hmm. um i said oh no 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 i'm not trying to get you to 
to leave what you're already doing. Mm -hmm. I want, I want your world to be additive, right? Like this is, this is about a total support system because if, if you can build a total support system, think about like a high performance athlete, right? Like whatever Mm -hmm. sport Mm -hmm. anyone likes the people doing it at the top these days, they've got their nutrition coach. They've got their endurance coach, their Mm -hmm. strength coach, their mental health coach. They've got Mm -hmm. a coach for all the different places. And then they go to training camps which are like the masterminds where mm-hmm. now, okay, I can go learn from these other athletes. They can tell me, and I think this is the coolest analogy, Chris, like I'm a big football fan personally. So I tend to talk in football analogies, mm-hmm. Which, mm-hmm. which work for some, not for others, but the idea of like a quarterback working with another, a couple of other quarterbacks and they watch a quarterback make a throw that they didn't see and asking the question, what did you see? I think that's such a, an amazing question. Like when someone hits an amazing market opportunity, like when they go in and they open an office in a new space and all of a sudden their firm takes off, adds that next seven figures of revenue, asking that person, what did you see that I didn't see? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Expanding the vision. Yeah. It's expanding. It's, it's huge, but make sure you do it with everybody. Like yeah. ask, ask that question to everybody. You Including know, like an intake team member. Like intake intake yeah you can learn from everyone and there's this idea of i always want to be in a place where people are smarter than me mm-hmm. and i think sometimes honestly chris I, I, call me guilty as someone who has like used that language in copywriting but the truth is that it's not just about being in a place where people are quote unquote smarter than you mm-hmm. you can ask someone who isn't smarter than you mm-hmm. Good, curious, interested questions and learn a ton. Now, mm-hmm. maybe what you're going to learn is I'm watching someone exhibit a bad behavior repeatedly, mm-hmm. but I've at least learned here. Mm-hmm. So it, it almost, it does a disservice sometimes to say like, oh, I have to be in a room where all the people are doing bigger business than me. Well, yeah, it's not 100% necessary. Are they the right match for who you're trying to become as a person as well? Yeah. And, and again, you have to do the work. You have to look behind everything that's going on and see the work that has to be done and not just be like, yeah, I want that. Well, but you're not willing to do the work for it. And by the way, you know, who's going to often out hustle some of the bigger people in the room are sometimes the small hungry players in the room. This is what I tell some of the you know firms I've worked with that are bigger firms and like, oh, you know, am I going to be one of the top 25% in the room? I'll tell them you might be the top 25% in numbers, but I don't know that you're the top 25% in year over year growth. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And to be in a space where people, yeah, are doing good numbers. You want people along your similar journey, but also people are hungry because Mm -hmm. then you get accountability because you don't want to be the person who did less than other people. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's something it's, it's, it's interesting. You said, um, you know, the hunger because I was recently on some different uh, podcasts and mastermind, you know, Zoom sessions. And a big thing that I've been talking about lately is where, where's, where's the excitement from people that just want to jump through hoops and dive over the desk at quarter or five on a Friday to grab that phone? Like, where is it? Like, I, I think of it as old school selling that needs to come back. Mm-hmm. How and- do we fix that? Yeah, the best way to really fix it is to believe that you actually have sales. You have you have a sales business. No matter what, you're you're in the sales business. Sales means getting clients and keeping clients. Mm-hmm. And when you understand that and you understand what it takes to sell, then you then you have that as long as you hire the people for attitude. Yes. Do you like, so when you're working with a firm and like helping them hire people with attitude, what are you telling them to look for? Like what's, what's the thing in the room that you would go, Oh yes, that's the perfect person. Yeah. Uh, so I definitely say attitude, but I, I also like get right down to, um, and I do like a lot of second opinion telephone interviews for, for clients. Oh, cool. I hire the final person and you know, People that they don't have to be in sales. They don't have to work at law firms. They just have to be people that are, are accustomed to hard work. So their, their family, um, 
had a farm and they worked on the farm. Uh, they've worked in retail. That's hard work, man. You're on your feet. Oh my God. Holidays and everything. Seven oh, yeah. days a week. And that's a sales environment. They talk about metrics. Yeah. Um, you need to hire somebody that their parents ran their own business. Yes. You need to hire someone that's worked in a restaurant. Hard work, hard work and you terrible pay, but you hustle. I mean, you yeah. hustle, hustle, hustle. So these are some of the things to look for. People that are accustomed to hard, hard work and have integrity and character. And then you test for that and you set up some questions to find out um, to, you know, what kind of answers are they going to give you based on all that? And then you you hold them accountable and you do um, uh, interview where they have to send you a video of a PowerPoint presentation telling you selling to you why they are the right person for your firm That's and cool. have them read a poem and they have to read it with enthusiasm and excitement. And therefore, can they, can they use a script, you know? Can, oh, that's really yeah, clever. Yeah. Can they impl- include their enthusiasm on, on a script? And I remember back in the day, someone used to say to me, sell me this pen. <laughs> yes yes <laughs> you know that's where i come from yeah <laughs> so i just think we need to go to old school selling hire people for attitude do our due diligence give them the best training that we can but train forever over and over and over and over again whether you like it or not as long as you have people working in your firm you're in the business of lifelong learning yeah lifelong oh it's uh... It's interesting the uh the talk that I gave over at Blue Shark. Um, you know, it's funny to think. I mean, look, in it obviously I used to be kind of the young guy in a lot of rooms that I went into, right? Yeah. And now I don't know if he, young guy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, I'm still young and dumb as can be, I'll say. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, just a little bit more, a little bit more lived in. Um, but uh, you know, I went into this. You're room like a where, worn out shoe now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my time has come uh so i was talking with them and in the room look it's a mixture of people who are my age or older but then there are some people who are younger and look i'm also even at my age i have i have two kids they're eight and five and so even sometimes lawyers who i coach who are maybe a decade older than me in some cases are weirdly enough in similar places in life to where I am. Mm -hmm. Um, But what I was telling them is I was sharing them this little like hierarchy of how you create value and get paid in the world. And it start, and there's four tiers to it. So the bottom one is the first thing you get paid for is what you do, right? Yet you develop some type of skill set, whether it's coding or it is stocking shelves, you get paid for what you do. The next level up is you get paid for what you know, right? You're a knowledge worker. Mm -hmm. Um, So gaining institutional knowledge, uh, all the, you know, the intelligence that you can apply that multiplies. That's the cool thing about like what you know, it can multiply. But the next level up, and most people will only ever be on those first two rungs. Mm -hmm. The next level up is you get paid for who you know the relationships you build and not just relationships you build, but you nurture. And, you know, that was one thing that I, for the first seven years of my career, I was terrible at, truly terrible at. I really bought so much into the like, like love Dan Kennedy. And one of the things that he would talk about is there's no problem you can't solve with a sales letter. And Mm -hmm. that was like, in your head. That's Yeah. yeah, that was so in my head which means I would be paid for what I do and what I know, because I would keep reverting back to those things. Mm -hmm. And I started thinking more about like, I need good, strong relationships. I need relationships that are uniquely mine. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know a lot of people these days talk about like building a personal brand, Mm -hmm. but to me, it was more about relationships. Like flaunting myself wasn't the thing. It was Mm -hmm. all that. So you get paid for who you know, and then after you've been paid for those three things, some people will ascend to be paid for just who they are, right? So like I look at uh, Seth Price um, mm-hmm. with Blue Shark. Mm-hmm. Seth, he's done a lot of stuff, knows a lot of stuff, has a ton of relationships. And these days, you know, like Seth goes to conferences 
And people are just attracted to Seth because they've heard his name around town. Mm -hmm. um, they So they recognize who he is. So he gets paid just for being who he is at mm -hmm. this point. Because, and this is important, right? Because went through the other three rungs before getting to the top. Mm -hmm. And that was the message I want to impart upon people is don't skip any of these steps. Get great at something. Learn as much as you can about it. Build a community around it. Mm -hmm. And then you may get paid just for simply being you. Yeah, that's that's really a, a good way to, to put it and to kind of impress upon people watching this. And what I hope to see for, for law firms is that I think attorneys are amazing. I think they do amazing work. I think that, you know, they're like the knights in shining armor. You know, they're, they're there to help people, but I would like to see that they go back and try to remember the reason they became an attorney. Yeah. And just remember that. And what was it? What was the passion? What, what was it that got you there? And then go back to the place when you first started at the law firm. How did that feel? What was yeah. that like? And how do you get that back um, so that you can just be in love with what you do yet again? Yeah. And therefore, your family is also first. Finding that spark, that, that is so important. You're right, Chris. I mean, that's like reigniting that passion. And it can sometimes be a difficult gateway in, I think, for some lawyers. Like, have you, when you're working with them for, is it, is it like they need to find a case that re-excites them? Is it, is it sitting down and talking about their purpose? Is it finding that story? Like, how do you help them through that journey? Yeah. I honestly feel that, that it's no different than every other team member in the firm. They want to feel valued. Mm -hmm. They want to be recognized. They don't want to feel like a machine that they have to produce and produce and produce and produce and produce. And um, yeah, that's, that's really, it's that simple. It is lonely at the top and anyone who's great at their profession, it's, it's kind of astonishing when I'm talking with law firm owners, I'm sure this happens to you as well. And like, I give them basically a pat on the back, like, Hey, you did, that was that was really impressive the way that you handled that situation. Mm. And boy, oh boy, if there's any reason to like work with a coach, it's that you don't hear that usually when you're at the top, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. People do take the person at the top for granted most of the mm -hmm. time because they also think like, oh, that person's got their stuff together. They're probably making good money. I'm sure it's easy. They, you know, cloud nine, owning a business, life's good, glide paths, yada, yada. It's like, uh, that person's still a human being. Mm -hmm. And a human being wants social connection mm -hmm. and values hearing. And it's tough. Even if you are hearing it from an employee, it still makes a difference to hear like, Hey, you, you've been a really good leader this past quarter. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Boy, you can, you can, you can make someone's day yeah. just that fast. If you recognize them and don't do it by email either, you know, Agreed. Take, take the time to tell them. I mean, in worst case scenario, do a video recording message and send it. I've actually done a few of those, especially for folks where like I catch it that it's their birthday and it's like a mentor that I really respect. If I have their phone number, I may text them me just like, and I'm admittedly, I, I can be a real sappy person, Chris. Like I don't know how <laughs> people know this about me, but I'm like, I'm a hugger. I'm a big old sap of a human being. I'm a hopeless romantic. I'm all of those things. Mm -hmm. And so I will send them a video where it's just like 90 seconds of me blathering on about how much I appreciate the role that they've had and how I see the way that they connect with the world and build others up. And because I want them to be able to like, hold on to it. I know that they'll probably watch it the one time. They'll never see it again. No, they're going to watch it more than once. <laughs> <laughs> in my head, I'm imagining them like on a hard day, pulling that out and going, Ah, right. Everything's good. We're good. Move forward. <laughs> and imagine if if um, the the owners, the top leaders, did that for their team. Ah, oh, that'd be cool. Wow, that would be huge. You know that the team member would like go home and show their spouse. Oh, they'd be, they, they'd be over. They'd show their grandchildren. They'd be over the moon. <laughs> <laughs> they would be. That's oh, that's actually look at that. See. 
by the way, that's the power of the mastermind, right? Like we had an extra brain in here that brought a brand new idea into the world. Exactly right. Exactly right. So how can folks get in touch with you? So I love these days to connect with people on the social platforms, uh, in particular, Instagram linked and LinkedIn, but even Twitter. So mm -hmm. you can look up my name, Charlie, C-H-A-R-L-E-Y, man, M-A-N-N. -N -N. And on both uh, Twitter and uh, Instagram, it's at Charlie Mann. And then if you search for me on LinkedIn, you'll see me. And I really do love connecting there because it allows me to, uh, when, when like when someone follows me on Instagram or Twitter, I follow mm -hmm. them back because I want to see what's going on. I used to be a lot more anti-social media and I'm a little bit anti trying to post stuff for the sake of the algorithm. Yeah. But I actually do like seeing what other people are doing. And then inevitably I'm going to track down your address. I'm going to write a handwritten card to yep. you because I will yep. have seen something that happened. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, if you want to, if you want to connect in those spaces, C-H-A-R-L-E-Y-M-A-N-N -N, uh, on any of those spaces. That's awesome. And my last few words, and then Charlie will tell you his would be, don't forget the importance of intake. If there was no intake department, there would be no law firm. So inspect what you expect, listen to call recordings and recognize your team. At the end of the day, they're a sales team. So what are your last words, Charlie? My last words are in life, you have to take certain leaps of faith, mm -hmm. but I like to equate a leap of faith to uh, an Indiana Jones when he's supposed to walk across this invisible bridge to take his leap of faith. And he's got his father's voice in his head telling him to walk across this chasm. And he closes his eyes and he steps down to what's an invisible bridge and solid. It's actually there. And the camera rotates over off to the side. And what you see is it's just a very well disguised rock pattern that makes it seem like the bridge isn't there, but it's been there the whole time. Mm -hmm. Just know in life, you've got these leap of faith moments take that leap. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Chris. So long, everyone. Chris Mullins with Expert Interview Series and Intake Academy. So long. Bye-bye. Thank you for tuning in to Lawyers Tell All, where Chris Mullins takes you on a journey with lawyers in the trenches who show you the realities of what it takes to succeed in this chaotic, crowded, ever-changing profession. Remember to visit our website, at www.lawyerstellall.com and enjoy even more great episodes like this one. Again, while you're here, subscribe to us via your favorite network. We look forward to seeing you next time on Lawyers Tell All.